Hey everybody, today I'm going to be reviewing Eight and a Half. This film came out in 1963. It was directed by Federico Fellini. So this is a film I think a lot of people see almost as like the, the Italian Citizen Kane of sorts, or like the, the Citizen Kane of the 1960s. Uh, it is very grandiose, very flashy, very ambitious, and very obviously influential. It's an idea that touches a nerve, I think, with audiences, but maybe even more so um, the artists or the creators. And there are some artists, obviously, that are uh, bold enough to take on a subject that analyzes this type of thing um, more introspectively, or as introspectively as, as the grand directors of that sort are, are capable of. But um, yeah, I would say Eight and a Half is a real anchor point for those types of movies, so far as inspiration is concerned. And Fellini, around this point, especially in the 1960s, uh, you know, he was beginning to break a lot more from uh, the traditional styles that helped shape him as a creator. Getting more eccentric and getting more psychedelic. I know, I feel like everybody gets annoyed that I say that word so often in my reviews, but it, it's true. I think he was just experimenting and he, he just kind of found a sweet spot so far as the confidence to explore all that stuff and the playfulness at the same time. And a lot of really great directors have a, a period in time where they felt very untouchable in hindsight, and I think with uh, Fellini this time was was that. And he started off more in the neorealism movement uh, back in the early 1950s, and I think because of that a lot of his movies had you know a lot of heart and emotion, um, but they were still accented with his particular brand of aesthetic that we could see uh, being born. More often than not, those films were more simple and stripped back, and the vulnerability was more the crux of the experience rather than the aesthetic. You do see it in movies like La Strada, you see it in Knights of Kiberia, you know, we're, we're dipping our toes into something that is a little more whimsical, and yet it's very much rooted in neorealism. But Eight and a Half compared to something like that just feels like a, a really, really gigantic leap, um, because Eight and a Half is, I mean, it's about the types of things that most creators consider to be an absolute nightmare. It's the lack of control as an artist, or I should say maybe the lack of ideas, writer's block. And Fellini did not know what his ninth film was going to be. You know, he would entertain one idea, go down one alley and find himself at a dead end, so he'd take another. Same thing would happen. I'm sure it's overwhelming and frustrating and stressful and all of that. Um, the pressure on him, I think, particularly at that point in time. And so, yeah, he decides to make something really uh, inspired out of all of that. He's making a movie about the nature of creativity, what it means to feel lost both creatively and how that reflects existentially. I do like this film a lot. I think for the most part, it is very, very well balanced and it's obviously taking on uh, a very convoluted uh, premise, one that's very easy to get tongue tied over. Like if you were to task me with like a, a self-referential type of thing, I wouldn't know where to begin. And so, you know, I look at Fellini and I'm amazed at how effortless he can be here. And it is very much rooted in the 1960s, very trendy world of like the, the art house cinema. So it's like a, a very melancholy adult world where you can just feel all the like the delirium of alcohol and just the cigarette smoke ugh, cigarette smoke just feeling really hazy it's like you can almost feel the hangover of like the vodka martinis but they're always peppered with these very you know psychedelic Fellini isms as I like to say um, that they remind us of that childlike vigor that rambunctious spirit that is beneath the kind of dulled exterior here this film kind of captures the poetry of life the absurdity of it all but also at the same time, it's trying to depict a life unraveling. And I think with Fellini, the reason he's able to get away with those things so well is that, yes, he's very aware of the, of the weight of pain, you know, the burdens of life, and yet there is always kind of a smirk in the gloom. You get swept up in the mood of it, obviously having somebody like Nino Rota and having so many of these characters kind of being able to hum their own theme songs and such, Obviously that helps kind of create a, a musicality to everything. But I like that he has this ability, like this eccentric sort of, you know, dance to your own rhythm sort of quality to his directing. This whole film, it just feels like we're almost like we're in a fancy ballroom doing this waltz and then we're transitioning from that to like this this carousel with all the lights. It's 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 really spectacular. I love the sense of humor in this film. I think the script in particular is just incredibly witty. I find myself laughing out loud a lot of the time. It's just yeah, like this mischievous court gesture, always in the shadows of the film, ready to maybe mock any heaviness, but also recognize kind of the, the joke that is life, that it is all bullshit, and that movies are naturally manipulation. And of course, life too. Life is an illusion of sorts too. So, you know, there's a lot, as I said, going on in terms of the, the weight of these ideas. And I think when you take on the meaning of creativity in a self-aware sense, especially as it applies to you as an artist or uh, whatever, I think it's it's very hard to be aware of that. It's very hard to kind of stand in the middle of that and keep everything centered. And I do think when it comes to uh, examining oneself through artistry, 
it's hard to maybe get vulnerable in that because I do think that a lot of times art can be toxic. And uh, I think that's a very interesting angle to explore, kind of the defense mechanism nature of art. For Guido, it's just a way to shut up all the critics and, and shut up his wives, all of these things. And so like, what comes out of that, I think, is a very interesting question. The lightness of this film, I do think, keeps it from getting, you know, too lofty, too pretentious, though at the same time, I find myself sometimes maybe admiring the film's cleverness uh, and the creativity of it more from a distance rather than, you know, getting really emotionally wrapped in it. And that is just a personal taste thing. I, I just, when it comes to Guido, I personally find other uh, protagonists of Fellini to be maybe more interesting or to have more uh, interesting arcs, more uh, maybe satisfying self-actualizations. Guido is somebody that is obviously very dishonest with himself. And so I think he takes a, a comfort in the romanticism of the, the cinema and how you can kind of um, color your own life that way, you know, because illusions can disguise truths, but it can also reveal them. And I just have to be honest, when it comes to Guido, as we start to explore him, and in turn, we're kind of exploring ourselves at the same time, I just don't feel like the movie is really I guess taking the risk, so the narratives are taking the risk for him to be able to remove a lot of those facades convincingly. And by the end, it didn't feel like a lot of his failings are tested in a way that allows a lot of these provocative questions to be fully explored the way that I wanted them to. And then the conclusion, which some people see it as perfect, and well, actually, no, a lot of people see, see it as perfect, I think, but um, for me, eh, I don't know. I, I like it, but I just don't feel like it's, again, really driving things home in the way that I wanted it. And I think watching it the most recent time is when it really clicked for me, because yes, the movie, as I've been saying, it is, it is so stunning to look at. It is so operatic and ornate, all of that so wonderfully detailed. And yet sometimes I feel like Fellini is maybe more interested in the way that he's presenting the ideas rather than actually exploring the ideas in a deeper sense. And unfortunately, the further he gets into his career, I think from this point, he gets more kind of wrapped up in the aesthetic. And so that kind of bothered me to some degree. But I don't think when I watch this film that Fellini has really learned a lot, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I don't think he's learned a lot about himself or necessarily about Guido in that artistic point of view. But again, I see it more as just kind of like a a fuck it, let's have a celebration sort of feeling. And the film, just like like all Fellini films, it has this beautiful, soulful Italian, you know, beauty and spirit to it. Every single shot, as I said, I mean, I just want to frame it on my wall. Holy crap, the black and white, you know, cinematography just up. Oh my God. All the shadows and like I said, the smoke and the light and everything is just so gorgeous. And again, it does feel very psychedelic. Like, you know, it's like we're taking this subconscious tour through like a like the fun house of life and all of its uh, Freudian implications and such, I guess. Now, again, are we really exploring it? No, but we are, we're taking a tour of it. We're hanging around for a little bit. We're having fun. And I do think, you know, it's very rare, obviously, for people to be able to face themselves in any sort of uh, meaningful way, substantial way, especially when it's through the lens of creativity, because that can be ironically even more revealing. It's like we are aware of the way creativity impacts life and, and vice versa, but it just never feels like I'm, I'm gaining more from that. And I just feel like when you have a thesis like this that you're posing, it just feels slightly counterintuitive to me. Maybe I'm dumb, I don't know, but I, I'm just going off my, my very honest instincts here. I think an example of kind of what I mean about just the way the film affects me would be, honestly, it's the opening, which is a very, very memorable opening. I think it's one of the most fantastic openings, I think, to a movie ever. Attention grabbing, it is eerie, it is just a jolt into the experience that I think nobody is maybe expecting. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, it's going to stick in their mind. It might be the thing that you remember the most out of the entire movie. The first time I saw the film, it really, really impacted me because, you know, we are obviously dipping our toes in the waters of all this like Freudian memory that is going to be a part of the like Carnival Fellini parade later on. And he's just, yeah, he's giving you hints, tastes of what you're about to see. And, you know, the more that you watch that sequence, you realize it is all there. As, as amazing as that scene is, I'm more impressed with it, I think, just as a singular sequence, at, you know, as an achievement, maybe less how it works in with the film. I think I am, again, more interested in how it you know, represents certain aspects of dreams, but not necessarily Guido's. But I cannot deny that it is really, really, really special. And I do think the opening here it, it's really bone chilling in the ways that I wish echoed throughout the rest of the film. I wish it had this kind of edge, this, this, this fear of lack of control from the artist 
especially in the end of the film. I wanted that to ring through. The jumping off the cliff sort of feeling, the Don Draper, you know, falling off the building in the suit, that image that, that was always associated with the show in the intro. The end of the film does have a melancholia to it, absolutely. It's, it's quite a sad ending, but um, it, it definitely keeps it very light, and that's, that's totally by design. It's a moment where our main character is more lost and more um, confused, I think, than he has ever been, and yet in that there's a weird calm in the chaos, I guess, and um, again, you know, you get to a point where there's just a... <sighs> you know, fuck it, let's just all dance and have a drink. Accepting the demons and, and dancing with them in this very like life's a circus sort of metaphor that we see in, in all kinds of Fellini movies. And um, I don't think many personal revelations come from that, but at the same time, there can be something very beautiful and honest about it. There's a bitterness and a sadness to that that ending at the same time, because it's it's like reflecting the hollowness of, of what happens to an artist when they lose their soul, what happens when they become too wrapped up in, in their brand. You know, once academics start to intellectualize it and critics get their hands on it, audiences and all these things, it's like we, we lose the spirit of who we were and we lose that 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 special creativity that we had but again i want a more committed angle there let's really go there and let's really explore that that type of idea but i still have a soft spot for fellini style anytime i might be unsatisfied i still can't help but be like oh but there's all this good stuff going on too and one of guido's big weaknesses in the movie is obviously his like feminine lust and and obsession and it tends to uh, obviously haunt him throughout the movie in all kinds of interesting ways but it all culminates eventually in what I think is just this fantastic uh, fantasy sequence, dream sequence, whatever you want to call it. And it, it's with him and all the different women in his life. And it is, I think it's it's hilarious. And I, yeah, I think it might be one of my favorite sequences in the whole film. It, it's just really joyous and, and there's a chaotic energy about it. But then there's something nightmarish about it. And then slowly it becomes very sad and very quiet. And I think it's that shift. It's, it's taking you on this journey of emotions where you really don't know where it's going to go. And the elasticity of that suspense, but in that, you know, playful, dreamy, fun sort of sense that is very Fellini, I just, I really like that. And the haunting, especially of the women in his life when they challenge him and when they challenge his creative li liberties, again, that's where things start to get more interesting. The way his wife kind of exposes his, his methods of control artistically and how they reflect reality or perhaps distort reality in unfair ways. And that's something that I think about all the time when it comes to creators. But yeah, I really wanted a lot more of that, especially in the third act. And I do think that I would have maybe wanted... A darker ending to this. I know that they they had one. I think they shot an alternate ending, but yeah, I just wanted something that had a little bit more uh, like tinged bitterness, that loneliness, that guilt, but also you can have that humor in the absurdity of life type thing. But it is a very dense film. There are so many little lines, so many little things going on at every single point, and it is one of those movies where Certainly I could feel different about it when I watch it five years from now. I have to say, the more I watch it, the more I find myself taken with it, the more I find myself really enjoying it. And yet at the same time, I still find myself kind of pulling from it, or I find myself emotionally disconnected from it. A strange sensation, but fun to probe. Of course, I recommend this if you are a cinephile, if you are a Fellini fan. If you just want to see a really great achievement here, then you've got it. If you want to see something that was very influential, I think you've got it. And some people, I think, might be really moved by this or find it to be wonderfully creative, and that's awesome. There are other Fellini films, I think, that might resonate with me more, but I think this is obviously, like, one of his peak films. This is the one that he's maybe known for the most. But uh, yeah, so that is my review. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to plug my website as always. It is deepfocuslens.com. I'm an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints of my work. If you are interested in any of that, you can always go to the website below. And if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below as well. Also, I'd like to give a shout out to my patrons who are great guys. Thank you so much for all your support. Welcome to the new members. If you are interested in supporting, the link for that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.